service today at Gregory Drive Church. We have so much to be thankful for, and one of the more recent things is that our Bible quizzers were able to finally have their first in-person quiz meet in two years. <laughs> so before we sing together, let's just watch a short video with highlights from that meet that took place last weekend. Our call to worship comes from Psalms 89. I will sing of the Lord's unfailing love forever. Young and old will hear of your faithfulness. Your unfailing love will last forever. Your faithfulness is as enduring as the heavens. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Unfailing love and truth walk before you as attendants. Happy are those who hear the joyful call to worship, for they will walk in the light of your presence, Lord. Would you please stand and let's worship together.
Thank you, worship team. That chorus, uh, the words are simple in the chorus, but they say a lot. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner, but now I'm not. With your blood, you bought my freedom. Hallelujah for the cross. Let's uh, pray together. Lord Jesus, we come to you as a church family with thankful hearts. You paid the price for our sins on that old rugged cross, but the grave could not hold you. Because you live, Jesus, we can face tomorrow and every other day that lies ahead. Lord, we pray for every person that calls Gregory Drive Alliance their church. And we especially pray for those in our church family who are sick, those who are discouraged, and those who are mourning the loss of a loved one. Our trust is in you, Jesus, because you have promised to always be with us. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. You continue to answer our prayers, even though our faith is often weak. Please forgive us for not always being strong and courageous. Thank you for Pastor Steve, Lord. We are so blessed to have Steve and Naomi and their beautiful family joining our fellowship, and we pray that their relocation to Chatham Kent will go smoothly. We ask a special blessing on Pastor Steve right now as he prepares to share your word with us this morning. May his words be your words, Lord, and may uh, we be attentive to the message you have for us today. Thank you for our other pastors and staff and for the many others in our fellowship who give so much of their time to help further your work in the different areas of ministry. Lord, we continue to pray for an end to the pandemic. We are thankful that things are slowly opening up and we ask for patience and tolerance as we continue to work our way through inconveniences we have to deal with. Lord, we pray for the persecuted church and for the many missionaries such as Lizette and the Karangis who are dedicated to caring for and bringing the gospel to those who might otherwise never hear of your wonderful plan of salvation. And bless the many churches in our own community. We pray that through our neighboring churches, your message of salvation is being delivered boldly and consistently. May your name be continually lifted up in this mission field we call Chatham Kent. We pray for our mayor and we pray for our counselors. We also pray for our prime minister and our premier and our MP and MPP. May they seek to govern using biblical principles. Lord, I thank you for the many prayer warriors we have in our church. May we continue to be church, a church that prays. Lord, our hearts are heavy right now for the people of Ukraine. Most of us don't understand why this is all happening and we don't know how to help but we can pray, and that is what we are doing. Please comfort those who are suffering through this awful situation, and please give wisdom and compassion to the world leaders. But most of all, we pray for an end to the violence that is being perpetrated against so many innocent people. You have commanded us to pray without ceasing. Help us to be obedient to that, Lord. We want to be more like you as a church and as individuals. Amen. Would you please stand with us and let's continue in our worship together. Jesus. 
Let's bow our hearts in a word of prayer together. Let's pray. Father, it's so good to come into your house this morning. Father, it's so good that we can come and we can sing these songs of praise. Father, as we come to your word, we pray, Lord, would you speak to us? Through your spirit, Lord, would you challenge us? Would you change us, Lord? Transform us into the image of your Son. We thank you, Lord, and we invite you into our presence this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. morning. Heard the story of a guy who bought a hunting dog, and he was eager to get that new hunting dog out, and so he decided to go out into the woods and hunt for bear. And they hadn't been out there very long when that dog caught the scent of the bear. And it started howling and off it went into the woods. And the hunter was running to try to catch up with it. But the dog was inexperienced. This was really its first hunt. And as it was smelling the ground, smelling the ground for that bear, it came to a place where a deer had crossed the path of that bear. And it smelled the bear and it smelled the deer and it didn't know which one to follow. And so it headed off following the deer. And now it was howling, going off in a different direction. And pretty soon, it came to a place where a rabbit had crossed the path of that deer. And it smelled the deer, and it smelled the rabbit, and so now it was off tracking the rabbit. And by the time the hunter finally caught up with that dog, it was barking triumphantly down the hole of a field mouse. And how often in life we are like that. In our Christian faith, we start off with great gusto. We come to Jesus and we say, we're going to change the world, Lord. And our hopes and our dreams are so great. And yet one compromise leads to another. And one diversion leads to another. And we get distracted. And even though we start out hunting bear, how often we end up barking down the hole of a field mouse. Sometimes it's important to just get back to the basics. Sometimes it's important to just remember why we're here. What are we doing this morning? I want to ask a very simple question this morning. What is church? What is church? Why do we do that? Why do we gather here in this place? I read one definition that said that church is a group of people who find themselves in a new relationship with one another because of their new relationship with Jesus Christ. In other words, we don't go to church, we are the church. The church is God's creation. The church is God's design. It's his way of providing spiritual care, spiritual nurture to his children. A community of faith through which the gospel is proclaimed As Bill Hybels used to say, that he loves the church because there's nothing on earth like the church when it's working right. There is no power. There is nothing greater. There is no no greater transforming agent on the face of this earth than the local church when it's doing what God has called it to do. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles this morning to a very familiar passage of Scripture that talks about the church before it even came into being. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 19. Matthew 16, 13 to 19. It says this, that when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, Jesus is speaking here before the church even was born at Pentecost. The word for church in the Greek is ecclesia. It comes from the verb kalao, which means to call out. In other words, the church is the called out ones. This was actually a a word that existed in the Greek language. If you would go to a town, within that town there would be the kalao. 
the, the called out ones, the, 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 uh, the ecclesia, the people that would come together and they would discuss the business of the town and they would get together for training and they would get together to, to they, they were like the, the leaders of the town, the called out ones. And that term got borrowed into what we call the ecclesia, the church today. This passage talks about the church, the function of the church, the role of the church in four different ways. Number one, it describes the church's foundation. What is the foundation? Jesus said to Simon Peter, on this rock I will build my church. Now it was a play on words, of course, we know that, that Peter, Petros, means rock. So he says, Simon, you are a rock, and on this rock I will build my church. And some people have taken that to mean, well, the church is built on Peter. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. The church isn't built upon Peter. The church is not built upon any person. It's not the elder's church. It's not the pastor's church. It's Jesus' church. He's the one who owns it. It's not just the Methodist church or the Baptist church or the Catholic church. Jesus says, I will build my church. It belongs to him. It's his church. The rock that the church is built upon is Jesus himself. It's the truth, the words that Peter spoke that are, impart, that are important, that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. It is upon that truth that Jesus is the Christ that the church is built. Everything is based on that confession. Like the song we sang this morning, Luke 6, 48, he's like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when the flood came, the torrent struck and the house could not be shaken because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like the man who built his house on the ground without a foundation. And the moment the torrent struck the house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete that faith is only as good as the foundation upon which it's built. In other words, faith is only as good as the faithfulness of the confession that it is based upon. We live in a relativistic age where people say, well, you believe what you want to believe and I'll believe what I want to believe. But belief is not the issue. Believing is not the issue. It's the faithfulness of what you believe in that ultimately is the issue. That's the important thing. I don't know if you've seen this picture before, but uh, the next slide from Hurricane Ike. Um, you know, do you notice something unusual about this picture? Hurricane Ike came in, these massive waves, they just tore up. This entire area was just absolutely decimated. Not a single house left standing. Oh, well, no, not actually true one house left standing and i remember after hurricane ike seeing this picture and a news crew went in and actually found the owner of that house and asked him why is it that your house stood when every other house as far as the eye could see did not and the man said simple I knew that someday there would be a hurricane. And according to code, when it said that you are to build six by six beams, I put in six by six beams, not the cheaper four by four beams. When it said you had to have a foundation that was so thick of concrete, I put in that deep of a foundation of concrete. I didn't skimp out. I didn't try to save money by putting in something else. I mean, that house, I'm sure when that, when that whole area was completely filled with houses you would not drive past that house and think oh that house is different than all the others it took a hurricane to show that this was a guy that had built his house to code he had built his house differently it was built upon a stronger foundation than the other houses around it and so when the storm came his house remained and the others were removed Foundations are important. Our faith is in Christ. The faithfulness of who we believe in is what is truly important. Years ago at Niagara Falls, these two guys were in a fishing boat, and the boat capsized in the river, and these guys were being swept down the river towards the falls. Now, if you've been to Niagara Falls, you know that 
all along the shore, they've placed these ropes on these, these kind of things that you throw out. And if someone's out in there in the water, you can throw this rope out to them and they can grab onto that and, and pull themselves into shore. Well, the two guys were being swept downstream. And someone from shore threw out one of the ropes and the guy grabbed it and hung on tight and it swung him back and it brought him into the shore and he was saved. And someone threw a rope out to that other guy and he grabbed hold of that rope. But the moment he grabbed onto that rope, a big log came floating past him. And he grabbed hold of the log with the other hand. He was holding this little thin rope in one hand, and he was holding onto this great big log with the other hand. And he thought to himself, well, the log's bigger. And so he let go of the rope. <laughs> Not a good decision. You see, the rope was attached to the shore. The other man survived because what he grabbed onto, what he relied upon, was secure. It was, it, was, it was based on the shore, and it pulled him in. When he let go of that rope and clung to that log, that log just went down the river, and it went over the falls, and that man was killed. The church's foundation. Upon this rock I will build my church, number one. But Jesus goes on. Jesus said, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That talks about the function of the church. What is the church's function? That God has given us the keys. What does that mean? Well, a key provides access, right? You can't get into your house or you can't get into your car without a key. It's authority. It's access. It, it, it provides you to go into something. Um, it represents authority. We have uh, just purchased a house here in Chatham. We're very excited. We're going to be getting the keys on April the 19th. As soon as we get the keys, that means we have access. We can now go into that house. I mean, we drove past it yesterday, but if we had have tried, you know, opening up the door, that wouldn't have been a good idea. What's the difference between someone who is house-sitting and someone who's breaking and entering? Permission, <laughs> right? It, I know you've probably gone on vacation before and you've given someone the keys to your house to go in and feed your cat, right? If, if someone gives you the key to their house, they are giving you free access. You can go in there and you can feed the cat, but then you can turn on the television, you can put your feet up on the sofa, you can go raid the refrigerator, you know, you, you can do what you want. You have free access to the home. That's what keys do. Keys provide access. And when, it's, when Jesus says here that he provides us keys to the kingdom of God, he's providing access, which means that through that authority that we can bring people into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. We can provide access for people who are lost and people who are alienated from God. We can provide a way for them to find a new relationship with Jesus and to go and be with him forever in heaven. Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith, from first to last, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Millard Erickson once wrote that the church is a repository of grace. It possesses the gospel, the good news of salvation. That we've been given the keys we, God has given us his gospel. And with that gospel, we can go and declare that for God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. During World War II, it said that there was a group of soldiers and they had a friend who had died. And they were far from a place where they could take their friend to bury him. And so they saw this little cemetery. There was a little house next to the cemetery. And they went and they knocked on the door of the house. And the Catholic priest opened the door. And they said, our friend has died. Would you mind us, would you mind allowing us to bury our friend in your cemetery? And the priest said, well, was he Catholic? And, and they said, um, no, no, he wasn't. He was, he was Protestant. And so the priest said, I'm sorry, you, you, you can't bury him in our cemetery. And they didn't know what to do, and so they went, and around the cemetery there was this fence. 
And so they went and they buried their friend just beside the fence, just outside of the cemetery. And they put a little rock there so they would know where his grave was. After the war, after several years, this group of soldiers went back. And they went back to find their friend to pay respects. And they found that little cemetery, there was that house. And they knocked on the door, and the same priest came and opened up the door. They said, I don't know if you remember us, but years ago we brought our friend who had died, and, and we asked to, to bury him in the cemetery, and he said no, so, so, we had, we, so we buried him just outside the cemetery, along the fence. But we were just outside, and we were trying to find that rock, and we couldn't find that rock. Do you have any idea of, of where that grave is? The priest said, I remember you. I remember you because I spent that night half of it praying that God would forgive me for not allowing you to bury your friend in the cemetery. And the other half of the night I spent moving the fence so that your friend would be inside. And that's the role of every generation is to move that fence, move the kingdom of God so that more and more and more people would come and more and more people would know and more and more people would find salvation. That's the role, the function of the church, to proclaim the gospel in every generation. I think most of you have heard the story of the Titanic. On April the 10th, 1912, that unsinkable ship, Titanic, set sail from England. There were 2,240 people on board, more than 1,500 never made it. We know the story that the Titanic struck an iceberg, the Titanic went down, the great unsinkable ship. There were not enough lifeboats. There were only 20 lifeboats. So the lifeboats were loaded, they were put down, the lifeboats sailed away. One survivor by the name of Eva Hart would later recount the horror of that night. As a little girl, she was placed into one of those lifeboats, and she said, I saw the ship sinking, but what I heard was even more dreadful. The cries of all the hundreds and hundreds of drowning people all around me. The lifeboats rowed themselves away from the ship. What most people don't realize is that those lifeboats the 20 lifeboats that were launched, none of them were full. In fact, most of them were only half full. There are hundreds more that could have been saved. But the lifeboats were afraid. Afraid to go back into that sea of humanity in the water. Afraid to pull people out of the water. Fearing that, you know, what happens if the boats get overcrowded? What happens if in the panic the boats get turned over? And so the boats decided to just row to a safe distance and just watch more than 1,500 people die. And unfortunately today, so often we're like that. As Christians, we, we're so concerned with our own stuff that we forget about the fact that all around us, all around us, are people that need Jesus. That all around us are people that have really never heard the gospel presented in a way that they could respond to. That all around us are folks that, that really need to come and that really need to know and that really need to find the grace and the forgiveness that Jesus offers. That's the function of the church, number two. But number three, what is the fruit of the church? It says here, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Binding and loosing, what does that mean? That Jesus has not only given us the keys to the kingdom, he's not only given us access, but he's given us the Holy Spirit to guide us, to empower us. That we have been called to take the spiritual resources of heaven, the unlimited, infinite spiritual resources of heaven and apply them to the problems of earth. 
In Jesus' name, we step out in faith with his spirit within us, and we bring health and we bring healing to the people that are around us. In Jesus' name, we bind. In Jesus' name, we loose. Galatians 5.22, the familiar passage says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Holy Spirit transforms us. Old habits, old addictions begin to fall away. Our character is transformed. We become different people. We've been called to take that power and to apply it to the problems of the earth. That's what Jesus did with his disciples. He sent them out to the highways and the byways to go out in his name and to cast out demons, raise the dead, heal the sick, feed the poor. And we've been called to do the same. There is great power in the name of Jesus Christ. I have seen this. So many times I've seen this in Kuwait, we very often would, would come uh, across um, folks that were demonized. And there's power, there's incredible power in the name of Jesus Christ. Paul Harvey used to tell the story of a, a little three-year-old boy. And his mom puts him in the shopping cart and she's going into the grocery sh- store. And she knows her son. So she says to her son ahead of time, now look it, we're going to be going down the cookie aisle. You are not getting chocolate chip cookies. I know that you love them, but you are not getting, we're not getting chocolate chip cookies today. We can't afford them, so don't ask for them. We're just going in, we're getting the basics, and then we're leaving. You got it? Okay, mommy, okay. And so down one aisle, the little boy was quiet. Down the next aisle, the little boy was quiet. But then they went down the cookie aisle, and he said, can I have some chocolate chip cookies? I told you. No chocolate chip cookies. We're not getting any chocolate chip cookies. Don't ask for them. You're not getting them. And then they're down the next style. Are you sure we couldn't just get one bag of chocolate chip cookies? We're not getting any chocolate chip cookies. Don't ask. And they're heading for the checkout. And this little boy knows that it's now or never. And so in his loudest voice, he shouts, In Jesus' name, can I have some chocolate chip cookies? And everybody in the store began to laugh. Paul Harvey says that that mother left the store that day with 23 boxes of chocolate chip cookies <laughs> that other people in the store had purchased and given them. Um, there is power in the name of Jesus, right? Yeah, I, I don't recommend that, kids, to your parents. It won't work. Um, after, I try, after I read this story, I tried it. It didn't work, so. Um, But there's power in the name of Jesus. That's the fruit. But lastly, the future. Jesus says the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, will not overcome it. The church is not a fortress. The church is a moving army. That's what this passage presupposes, right? It says the gates of hell will not overcome it. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you were overcome by a gate? Right? When was the last time you're walking down the street, minding your own business, and a gate jumped off its hinges and came running down the street after you? Right? That doesn't happen. Gates are stationary. This passage assumes that the church is not. That when it says the gates of hell shall not overcome it, it means that nothing will be able to stand in the way of God's army moving forward. The only way that the gates of hell prevail is when the church of God does not move forward. When the church of God remains stationary. Matthew eleven twelve 12 says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. That word forceful in the Greek is a great word, biazo. It comes from the word bios, which means life, living, biology. It's the picture of, you have this concrete sidewalk, and there's a little crack in the concrete sidewalk, and a little seed falls from a tree, and it goes down inside that crack, 
And over time, the water begins to penetrate. And soon there's a little green sprout. And it gets bigger and bigger. And pretty soon, that concrete pad, that concrete sidewalk, so strong that you can walk across it, you can drive across it, nothing can... That tree just begins to grow and it just demolishes that concrete. The power of life. We know from the end of the book what the outcome is, don't we? We know what the Bible says. In Habakkuk 2.14, And the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So we don't have to wonder how this thing ends. <laughs> we don't have to wonder about what happens in history. We know that one day the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In other words, the job gets done. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every language will be represented in heaven, which means that one day it gets done. And can I tell you, we're not that far off from that day. Until then, we have work to do. But we know what's before us. We know that there's a heaven that's before us. We know that there's an eternal home that's before us. I shared the story of the Titanic. There were many famous people that were on the Titanic that day that it went down. But let me tell you a story you've probably never heard. That there was a man on the Titanic by the name of John Harper. John Harper was a pastor from Glasgow, Scotland. He had been called to travel to America to become the new pastor of Moody Church in Chicago. And so his wife had died several years before. John Harper and his daughter were on the Titanic, crossing the Atlantic so that he could become the pastor of that church. After the ship hit the iceberg, John Harper took his daughter and he put his daughter into one of those lifeboats. And then John Harper began going around the ship, asking people the same question. Have you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? The ship went down and John Harper was there bobbing in the water with so many others. And yet he wasn't trying to save himself. He was swimming from person to person, asking them the same question. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? There was this one young man that had climbed up onto a piece of wreckage. And he swam up to him and said, young man, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? And the young man said, no, sir, I don't. He said, well, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And just then a wave came and swept him away. And that young man was laying there on that wreckage, thinking about that question. Of all the times in his life that he had heard about Jesus, but had never responded. Just then a wave brought John Harper back. <laughs> and he cried out again to this young man, young man, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ yet? <laughs> and he said, no, sir, if I have to be honest, I don't. And he cried out one last time, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And he died. The young man lay there on that wreckage, looking up at the sky, and he knew what he had to do. He invited Jesus to come into his life to save him. He knew he didn't have long. I said that the lifeboats rolled out, rode out to a distance. These half-filled lifeboats rolled out to a di rode out to a distance and just sat there watching the sea of humanity die. There was one lifeboat that didn't. There was one lifeboat, lifeboat number 14, that said, we can't just sit here and watch all these people drown, die in the cold water. And they rowed back in. Of all the people, the 1,528 people that went into the water that night, 
six of them were saved by Lifeboat 14. And one of them was the young man that had climbed up onto that wreckage. He became an evangelist. For the rest of his life, he would go from church to church. Many, many people came to Christ because of his testimony. And uh, he once shared his testimony at Philpott Memorial Church in Hamilton. He would always end his testimony by saying this, that I am John Harper's last convert. The last man. John Harper was a guy who wasn't interested in saving himself because he knew where he was going. He knew where his future home was. He knew what lay before him. And so instead of trying to, being so concentrated on trying to save himself, he sought to save others. And we should be the same, shouldn't we? Because we know the future that's before us. And we know the joy, we know the glory, and we know the home that sits before us. We know our future. But there's a lot of people in this city. There are neighbors that we know, people across the street, and around the world. Millions and millions of people who don't know that yet, who don't know what their future holds. The function of the church, the fruit of the church, the foundation, and the future. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day you've given to us. Father, we thank you that you have given us the keys to the kingdom. You have given us this wonderful gospel, and you have given us the power to proclaim it. The Holy Spirit is within us. You have given us the authority to bind and to loose. It's just our job now, Father, to be obedient, to go, to take this gospel, to take those keys, to, 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 to stand upon this this foundation that you've placed us upon, this truth, and to proclaim it wherever we go with whoever we see. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Please stand with us and let's sing together.
as you leave this place, remember you are the ecclesia. You are the called out one, so act like it. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and grant you his peace. God bless you. Have a great week.